Hello, Philippe. Hi, hi. Uh, welcome in uh, Dublin and uh, thank you very much for uh, accepting our uh, invitation. So, you are uh, an international uh, leading figure in uh, critical cartography, in thematic mapping. You worked uh, for the French journal Le Monde Diplomatique, uh, for the United uh, Nations. You are interested in the relations between uh, art and cartography, in the global migrations between the global south and the global north. So, my first question for you you is uh, uh, how and why did you became a cartographer? Well, that's, a, that's an old story. I think we have to go back uh, up when I was a little kid. Uh, I remember very well when I was eight, eight nine years old, so I was lying down on the, on the carpet with looking in atlases and encyclopedia and uh, seeing in Scandinavia those you know, large forests of uh, pines and snow, and I was just dreaming living the society, living the civilizations with a truck where I would have put all my toys and my cars and everything, a big truck, and just drive up to the forest, build a house, and just stay there. And I was really co completely fascinated by those encyclope encyclopedia of geography. And it has remained something when I was starting to draw maps of the, you know, the routes I would take from Paris to Scandinavia, and then I, want, and I wanted to go to Central Asia in the steppe. I so this is very early meeting with geography, so to speak. Then I gra graduated a few years after, 10 years, and uh, in geography, I had the worst mark ever when I graduated. I finally got my graduation, but really the geographical one was the absolute worst one. And I decided that I didn't want to go to university, uh, right after the graduation, but I wanted to work, to be a worker. I had this idea, it was in the 70s, at the end of the 70s, that I really wanted to be a worker. And the only things I could do is to drive. I had my driving license and to drive small trucks. So I became truck driver. And I started to drive trucks all over Europe for two, three, four years. And once I arrived, uh, you know, just before the Mont Blanc tunnel and there was snow, and you couldn't pass, and I was staying there without money, uh, trying to reach my boss, which is you just uh, uh, apply catch-22, you do whatever you can, but I can't help you. And I decided that was enough. And when I arrived there, I thought it's enough, I have to begin to study. And I was thinking about history, because I was very uh, fascinated by history, not so much geography. Arriving to the university, for the inscription, there was a 500 meters queue for history, and the door of the geography department was open with nobody. And I thought, if it's, there is nobody there, it's probably for me. And remembering that uh, all along those trips I have done over Europe, I have seen landscapes, cities, different culture, different countries. And I thought I had maybe to understand what I have seen, and maybe study geography will help me to understand all this. Remembering also when I was laying on the carpet, I thought geography is for me. And I started geography both on the dream, on the child dream, on the kid's dream, and uh, on the fact that I had the, the field experience before having the desk experience, the, the, the academic experience. First you see something and you see landscapes and, and society and cultures and people, and then you thought they are so different. That can be explained. That can, that might be uh, explainable by some things. Let's go to geography. This, this is how I started geography, and from geography, I very very uh, rapidly understood that the, the the tool, the most effective tool, to express your idea, the most struggling tool, is cartography. So I don't consider cartography as a discipline as itself. I don't consider myself as a cartographer, so to speak. I consider myself as a geographer, which is using cartography to convey messages, to express ideas, to define concepts, to try to, to explain the world, to uh, probably uh, try to make visible, invisible trends or things you can't see with eyes because this is the statistics. Uh, so, and I became a cartographer through my geographical uh, background and studies, but I'm, I consider myself really at first as a geographer, and I say now ca geographer, cartographer, and information designer, because uh, uh, the information is designed not only by maps, it's not only spatial, it doesn't happen only on the space, in the space or on the landscape, but also through visualizations which can be abstract, abstracted from space. 
What you said uh, recalls to me a figure of French geographer, Eric Dardel, who argued that uh, geography and uh, cartography are uh, in fact an intimate relationship between uh, humankind uh, and uh, the earth, uh, landscapes, uh, environments, uh, before uh, becoming uh, a discipline, a technical knowledge. Yes, the, um, uh, there is maybe in geography more, more than in other disciplines, you have this relationship uh, to, yeah, to the world, to the nature. Uh, uh, at the beginning, geography was that, was explaining the nature, and it has become uh, human geography because the human were uh, intervening in the nature, they were organizing the nature. And I used to say that you have the nature, the environment, the space, and human being, which are uh, I don't know how exactly which word you can use, structuring the space, organizing it, organizing infrastructure. And I, I like very much the idea that human being produce its own space out of what the nature is doing. But this is, this is the, the base. So this is what we, are, we can call it uh, geography or cartography uh, 1.0. Now we are in the geography cartography 3.0, 4.0 because uh, with the speeds of the financial flows all around the world, in the, in the millions of seconds, you can send billions of dollars all over the planet to New York, from New York to Hong Kong and Hong Kong to New York again. Uh, uh, the space has another dimension, so to speak, and we have to take this into consideration and to find a way to represent this. So we are um, uh, losing this contact with the soil, with the ground, uh, uh, more and more. Uh, although, you know, a tanker which is uh, charging oil, crude oil in Kuwait, still goes on the sea for reaching Rotterdam or New York. So this is very concrete. And this is the visible part. Uh, but there is an invisible part now, is that these uh, 200,000 tons of crude oil could be sold and bought more than 60 times by people which are speculating from, uh, from uh, tax havens, and you don't see it. And this is, in, in terms of geography, it's also very important. And um, what is the challenge of uh, critical cartography to this uh, invisible geography? Yeah, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is exactly uh, that. Um, what we call critical uh, cartography, which is a movement which, which comes maybe at the end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s, uh, um, long after the beginning of uh, the, this uh, uh, critical geography movement uh, at the beginning of the 60s uh, in the United States with uh, the Bungie work and the Bungie research. And this is exactly uh, the idea of making visible things which are invisible with using the new tools uh, statistical treatment, big data treatment, and try to see within those huge, large amount of number and statistical table where you don't see anything. When you, when you look, at a, look at a statistical table, you just see numbers black and white, and you don't see anything until it's treated and uh, transformed into a visualizations which will show the trends. And th that was the base of uh, the research in uh, critical cartography to make visible what was invisible. And the example of the tanker, uh, which th floats, uh, which goes from a place to another, it's the visible. But what is invisible is much more important to understand how our society is working and functioning. But this is not all. Uh, the critical cartography movement was also, also aiming uh, in front of the development of more and more um, discrimination, more and more big gap between poor world and rich world, to find a tool to, um, to depict that, to show the extent of this gap, to show, to work for social justice. So it was using cartography by activists. Uh, critical cartography has not been put in place by geographer or cartographer. The first ones which were using uh, uh, critical cartography which is called sometimes radical cartography or counter cartography or alternative cartography. And now there is a development in these trends uh, of something that can be called experimental cartography to try visualizations, sort of map, to help the movement of social justice 
to fit the gap between uh, uh, this uh, world which is more and more discriminating the, the poor and which is more and more uh, concentrating the wealth, etc. So uh, this, is, this is the first step. Uh, I, would finish, I would just conclude on these uh, questions by one thing which is very important. Denouncing, showing is the first step, is the module number one of critical cartography. You, you denounce, you show, you, it's a project, but it's very passive. Within critical cartography, there is a second step, which is while you have shown, when, while you have proved where the injustice is, then there is an act on, on the field. You act on the field. You deliver this to activists, which, is, which are in charge of active on the field, and it goes together very well. And this is why the critical cartographers, artists, activists, uh, we have to mention the work of uh, uh, Trevor Paglen, for example, have been acting on the field to try to stop the trends. And of course, they are, confront, they are confronted to police, they are arrested, they go to on trial, etc. So they are really uh, uh, putting themselves in, in front of the real life, uh, which is not only showing things, writing, publishing books and maps, but also acting on the field. And uh, what is for you the Global South? So Global South is, uh, again, <laughs> An expression that it's not very easy to define this in in few minutes because uh, we have to go uh, far in the history. Uh, just to recall that until the 80s, it's not long time ago. We speak about three decades, like 30 years. At the ge ge geological scale, it's it's really uh, very little. We had this idea that there was a world in the north and a world in the south, which were poor, and the north, which were rich. And we were basically denying the, the, the diversity, the variety of what was this South. And we were not that interested. We just, we, we had a, a third world approach where those poor uh, people in the country had to be helped. And then we were helping by corporations, by sending money. And this is, the, that was the only uh, approach we had of it. And at least that was also what we were uh, teaching to the school, to, the, to the, uh, the, the child at school and even at the university when we, we really have. And remember you had on all the maps this big black line, the divide between the third world, the developing country and the developed country, uh, which was really, uh, which had no, no sense other than uh, the one you would give saying uh, under this line the people in average are earning less than $2,000 and above this line on average uh, people will earn more than $200,000 but that was really denying the diversity uh, within the poor uh, countries where you had rich people but also within the, the, the rich countries where there was also millions of poor people and thinking about in the United States in certain area of New York where the, uh, the, 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 the average revenue was sometimes lower than in certain uh, countries which were considered to be poor in, in Africa or in Asia. So now this has changed, of course. Uh, there was, all along the Cold War, there was also uh, this idea that you had the rich world and the big world, but there was also the Cold War, and the world which was not a bipolar world or, or a world in two parts, but finally in three parts, because uh, the Cold War was this bipolar world between the communist uh, world and the occidental world, and how they more or less shared the rest of the world. It's very arrogant to say it like that, the rest of the world, uh, this whole thing. And uh, for 50 years almost, there was this influence, and they tried to get more and more influence in this country or in this country. Uh, with the end of Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union exploded between 89 and 91, fall of uh, communist countries and fall of Soviet Unions, then it has completely changed and the global south has tremendously complexified because uh, some countries started to emerge, India, China, S South Africa, Nigeria, Brazil, Indonesia, uh, at m different speed creating an environment which is very difficult to read. We don't have the grid to read this environment today. So it's uh, basically 20 years, a little bit less than a generation, during which everything has been completely put the, the, the head uh, uh, around with a world which we, we, we would define as a polycentric world or a multipolar world with a lot of different power uh, here and there, and not only a big power, although you have a big power, which is called United States, which is still 
trying to have an effect here and there, but, uh, and they are present all over the world, and they have, they have a devast uh, devastating effect a little bit everywhere, but they basically do not control any uh, much more than an, a quarter of Baghdad, or they don't control uh, much more than a few hundred meters in Afghanistan, or they don't control, they are unable to control Libya, they are unable to control even a short part of Syria. So they are present, they are devastating, but they don't control anything. So it's a very paradoxical way. And this global south has exploded in a multiple center that we call the south in plural, uh, which today is very, very difficult to read especially because, um, and I will conclude by this, um, we, we got out of the geography, so to speak. We can say there is countries which have different level of development, different level of governance. And we will see with the map of the war that the war occurs where the governance is very low level. But today you have a, a very large movement, which is a world movement, a global movement of international jihadism, which is using nation states to operate, but which superimpose to these nation states in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, in Philippines, in Indonesia, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Mali, in Nigeria. They, ha they are linked. They exchange fighters, technology, arms, and they, they use nation states to operate like a state, but they don't have any territory. So this is like a state that superimposed to nation states. And this is a new reality, which is extremely difficult to figure out and to map, which is part of the global south, because you could understand the jihadist, the jihadist, international jihadist movement, not only IS or not only Boko Haram, I mean, the, really, the link between all those uh, armed groups, which, uh, which are no government and with, which have no territories, except in Syria, where they, they are rooted a little bit, or in Libya, where they are rooted, um, you could interpret that as uh, insurgency, as a reaction against capitalism, a reaction against power. So part of the global south, but not geographized, so to speak. The very last question, uh, what is your favorite maps uh, among the hundreds uh, you made in your career? Uh, you mean of my maps? Yes. Uh, that is a little bit difficult uh, questions to answer because uh, <laughs> if, you, if you give the favorites to one, then you exclude the others. Um, I, there is one that uh, I have um, drawn uh, out of uh, collective reflections, and it's about the, the, the way to define Europe. Uh, there was a long time ago um, in my office in the newspaper, I received a bunch of uh, pupils 17 years old, just before graduation. And they came to me and said, Mister, we have an assignment. We have to draw the borders of Europe. So in the west part of Europe, we, we know where the borders are, are, are of Europe. This is the Atlantic, you know. Atlantic, it's clearly the border, the west, western border of Europe. But we have a problem to define where in the east the Europe is finishing. And where is it exactly? Is it the Ural Mountains? Is it, uh, you know, the... Uh, Istanbul with the, uh, with the ISM, is it somewhere else? Is it, uh, what's the definition? Is there, is the Muslim and Orthodox world different from the Christian world? Uh, we, we don't really know and it's very difficult and I think you have the answer because you work for uh, news, international newspapers, uh, you know, analyze, analyzing uh, geopolitics. And I, of course, I didn't have the answer myself and I decided to draw a map with the uh, various possible border of Europe. Uh, and this map shows that, finally, uh, the way we have defined the eastern border of Europe was uh, nothing else than an intellectual construction based on political need at the time. Uh, the Europe from Atlantic to Ural is an invention of General de Gaulle, which wanted to have an alliance with the Russians. Uh, above the head of the Germans at that time. So, and then after that, this has stayed, and even the economists for uh, a while have represented Europe from Atlantic to Ural, and then they were separated uh, Russia in two. Part of Russia was in Europe, and the other part of Russia was in, in Asia. So that was a little bit strange to have these cuts like that. But at the end, when you see the map, uh, my conclusion was to say there is no eastern border of Europe. There is uh, several different uh, interpretations of what it is, but for me it was just uh, 
when you consider Europe and Asia, and then this Eurasian continent, that Europe was just finishing in a very long, 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 long hug into Asia. And you couldn't say anything else than that, because there is basically no limit and no border, other than this very, very, very long and very uh, slow uh, uh, transition in between this huge Eurasian continent. Okay, thank you again, Philippe. Uh, I hope that you will uh, enjoy this Global South Week uh, that we are organizing in. Yeah, this day. I'm, I'm from the global anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you.